Okay, hi everybody, it's the 2017 paper, part 2, questions 11 to 20. This follows on from the first part we did earlier on in the year. Remember your data sheet is there with all the numbers you might require. And let's scroll all the way forward then to question 11. We left it at question 10 last time with the photoelectric effect. This is question 11 about coherent sources. Waves from coherent sources have the same velocity? Yes, they do. Waves from coherent sources have the same wavelength? Yes, they do. Waves from coherent sources have a constant phase relationship? Yes, they do. It's 1, 2 and 3. Coherent waves are basically identical. Question 12. A ray of red light passes from a liquid to a transparent solid and both the solid and the liquid have the same refractive index. So that means nothing's going to change then when you go from one substance to the other. There'll be no change in the speed, no change in the wavelength, no change as E. Question 13. A ray of blue light passes from air into a transparent block as shown. Remember we have to use the angles that are measured to the normals. And if we want the speed of light in the block, we need the refractive index first. So N equals sine of the angle in air over the sine of the angle in glass. So sine 60 over sine 40 gives us a refractive index of 1.35. So we're now going to use that refractive index to work out the speed of light in the block because N is also equal to the speed of light in air over the speed of light in glass. So rearranging it for the speed of light in glass, it's 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 1.35 gives us an answer of 2.23 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, now watch your rounding here. Because the 1.35 was rounded, what we should really have done was kept the answer for sine 60 over sine 40 in our calculator. And then kept the value for that in our calculator. And then divided 3 times 10 to the 8 by that number. That would have given us the 2.23. Either that, or you could have done it by sine of the angle in air over the sine of the angle in glass equals the speed in air over the speed of glass and rearranged it for the speed of light in the glass, which is the speed of light in air, times the sine of the angle in glass over the sine of the angle in air. Doing all that in a one -er would have given you 2.23 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Answer D. So if you find you maybe don't get an answer that exactly matches one of the answers, then watch your rounding. Right, question 14. A student carries out an experiment to investigate how irradiance varies with distance. A small lamp is placed at a distance d away from a light meter and the irradiance at this distance is displayed on the meter. And this measurement is repeated for a range of different distances and the student produces the graph. And that graph indicates that there's a systematic uncertainty in the experiment. It doesn't go through the origin. So it might be because the irradiance is too high, or it might be because all our 1 over d squared values are too low. If all our 1 over d squared values were bigger, it would pull the line along towards the right, so it's more likely to go through the origin. So, something's wrong with the system that we're using. One of our sets of values is out by the same amount all the time. Is it the irradiance? Or is it the 1 over d squared values? Well, we don't know, but let's have a look at the options and see which of the following would be most likely to reduce the systematic uncertainty in the experiment. Would repeating our readings and calculating mean values reduce the systematic uncertainty? No, it wouldn't, because if they're all out, they're all still going to be out. So A is, is wrong. That's not our answer. What about replacing the small lamp with a larger lamp? No, we want a point source. We want a small lamp. So that wouldn't reduce our systematic uncertainty. So B is wrong. C, decreasing the brightness of the bulb. 
No, nope, that's not going to affect her systematic uncertainty. Repeating the experiment in a darkened room? Yes, if there is light in the room, it's going to make all our irradiance readings too high. We want to do it in the dark. Increasing your range of distances makes no difference, so it's D. Tough question. Question 15 is still on irradiance here. A point source is 8 metres away from a surface and the irradiance is 50 milliwatts per square metre. If we now move it to 12 metres away, what will the new irradiance be? Well, there's our relationship and we're looking for I2, the new irradiance. Let's substitute our values in. So I1 was 50 milliwatts. Let's not bother with the prefix just now. Uh, our first distance was 8 metres, so we're going to multiply that by 50 times 8 and don't forget to square it. Our new irradiance is I2, which will be in milliwatts, times our new distance, and our new distance was 12, don't forget to square it. Then rearrange for I2 is 50 times 8 squared over 12 squared, and if you do that on your calculator, you're going to get a value for I2 equal to 22.2 and that'll be in milliwatts per square metre. Units of the irradiance stays the same. That's answer A, 15A. Okay, moving on, question 16. Uh, this is AC electricity, the output from an AC power supply is connected to an oscilloscope and there's the trace we see. The Y gain setting is 1 volt per box vertically. So therefore the peak voltage, well the peak of the wave is 3 divisions high. So it will be 3 divisions times 1 volt per division is 3 volts. That's the peak voltage. And we are asked for the RMS voltage of the power supply. Well if you want the RMS voltage, it's the peak voltage divided by root 2. So 3 divided by root 2 gives us an answer of 2.1 volts. That corresponds to answer A. Question 17 comes up every year. A 20 microfarad capacitor is connected to a 12 volt supply. What's the maximum charge stored on the capacitor? Q equals CV. The relationship on your relationship sheet is C equals Q over V. People always mix up the C and the Q. C is capacitance, Q is charge. So if we want the charge, it's C times V. So 20 times 10 to the minus 6 is the capacitor. 12 is the voltage. So Q, the charge stored, 2.4 times 10 to the minus 4 coulombs. I think that exact same question has been in the 2015, 16 and 17 paper. Exact same question. There you go. 17. Here's question 18. Now, this is tricky. It's a voltage divider and an energy stored on a capacitor. We have to calculate the maximum energy stored on the capacitor. Well, first things first, we have to work out what the voltage across the 120 ohm resistor will be. So do the voltage divider first. It's a national 5 relationship. V2 is R2 over R1 plus R2 times Vs. So 120 over the total of the two resistors added together is 600 times the 6 volt supply. Means the voltage across the bottom resistor is 1.2 volts. And that's the voltage that we're going to use across the capacitor when it's fully charged. Energy on a capacitor is a half CV squared. 30 times 10 to the minus 6 times 1.2 squared. That gives us an answer of 2.16 times 10 to the minus 5 joules. And if we round that correctly, that's 2.2 times 10 to the minus 5 joules. That corresponds to answer E, 18E. Question 19 is about conductors, insulators and semiconductors. Three statements, which of them is or are correct? In conductors, the conduction band is completely full. No, it's not. It's only partially full. In insulators, the gap between the valence band and the conduction band is large. Yes, it is. And in semiconductors, increasing the temperature increases the conductivity. Yes, it does, because 
heat energy will free some electrons, move them into the conduction band and it will conduct the better. So 2 and 3 are correct, that's answer E. Last one then, question 20, and here it is, it's the unknown equation. You've never seen this relationship before. There will always be an unknown equation question somewhere in your paper, but don't panic because you'll be told what all the symbols are, and you'll be told all the numbers apart from one, and that's the one you need to find. And in this case, we need to find the distance. Now, in that relationship, it's d squared. So let's rearrange that relationship uh, and make d squared the subject of the equation. So d squared will be equal to L over 4 pi f. L is equal to 6.1 times 10 to the 30 divided by 4 times pi times f and f was 4.4 times 10 to the minus 10. Now this is going to give you a huge number then on your calculator. You're going to get a value of 1.1 times 10 to the 39. But remember, that's d squared. That's not the answer. Watch out, because that will be one of the options. That's option d, and that's wrong, because that's d squared. We're going to have to square root that to get d the distance to the star. So the square root of 1.1 times 10 to the 39 is... 3.3 times 10 to the 19 meters. That means it's answer A. Well, there you go. That's the rest of the 2017 multiple choice paper. That's pretty tricky. Look over it a couple of times. We'll see you in the next one.